Yes, welcome to Berean number two, the first part of Berean number two. And we are here at the home of Patricia Tudosa. Patricia, you don't want to move around and say hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the others on the couch. But in any case, so let's start. A warm welcome to all of you, especially those who are uh, online. Uh, David Owen, Melbourne. Let me see. Oh, now I'm in trouble. I've got to memorize all 11 of you. I know um, there's Chris Ong in San Francisco, Andre in uh, San Diego. There are three of you in Malaysia, I think. You've got um, Pat Toe. You've got Michelle Wong, and you've got Like It Louis, and then we have Brian Wallach from Pretoria um, in South Africa. I know you're right now in Cincinnati for a concert or something like that. <laughs> uh, we've got, oh, uh, Sarah's not here, but then we've got um, Caroline Jeffs, I think it is, as well as um, Ashley Bird from Columbia. I think I've more or less covered everybody. If I've forgotten somebody, do excuse me. And today, we're going to go and have a look at archaeology. Look at the slides. On the third slide, you'll see number two, archaeology. How scientific discoveries shape the interpretation of the Bible. So the first thing I want you to remember is that archaeology is a science. It's a science that needs an art. So you could call it an art of the science or science of the art. So what is the scientific part and what's the artistic part? The scientific part is using instrumentation and using to, to analyze and um, using labor to dig up stuff, using satellites to find out where to dig. The artistic part is probably the more important part, which is interpreting the data. So for example, you go to Israel or Turkey or, any, or Jordan or any of the other holy lands, and you discover a coin or you discover a pottery shard. You want to find out date, location, why it was there, who was involved in all of this, and a lot of it is not written down. And in fact, most of archaeology is not historical, it's prehistory. What does that mean? History refers to anything after the writing has um, turned out. So you have words to tell you, perhaps a date, location. But very often in um, typical archaeology, it includes artifacts with no words, no writing, no numbers. And then you've got to interpret it using other means, most um, importantly, radio chronometry, which is using radioactive uh, material as a decay to estimate the measure of the age of the stuff. Biblical archaeology is mostly within the historical period because um, in the Middle East, history starts about 3500 BCE. And we have we don't have any real reference to anything before 50, uh, 3500 BCE in the Old Testament itself, partly because Abraham would bring us to about maximally 2000 BCE. And before Abraham, they are mostly legendary. Uh, so when you say, when did Noah live? We don't know he, if he was a uh, physical, uh, historical person or not, so <coughs> we can't guess. When did um, Adam and Eve live? So these are more prehistoric times. We have no reference to that whatsoever. So for the purpose of archaeology, they are not part of the purview. We are looking at what can we find. Now, in the event, and someone asked me this, is it possible for us one day to find the bone of Adam? Um, purely from a scientific point of view, it's always possible. You never want to say no for science. But you want to say the probability is very low because in terms of literature, in terms of the Old Testament, they were not talking about historical issues, they were talking about theological issues. But in the event someone finds a bone and is identifiable to Adam, for example, and I don't quite know how you're going to do that because we don't have any dates of Adam's existence in the Bible, then in theory we can say, yes, now we have a pre-historical archaeological artifact. Okay, so that's just to answer some questions of people who think uh, is science too biased? Do they say nothing can happen? Good science never says never, ever, because you always want to revise your knowledge. So turn to the next slide, if you will. And I'm going to start with 10 archaeological discoveries that I'm going to highlight today, just very briefly. And they're not the 10 most famous, they're not the 10 greatest. They are uh, the 10 that have been accepted by quite a lot of people as being quite stunning, visually as well as geographically. There are quite a lot of them in the book that, I will be, that I'll be writing later on. I'll include 40 archaeological artifacts that are relevant to the Bible, but here are the 10. So the first one, Nakhamadi, then Ain Dara Temple, Tel 
Tell then uh, Stella of David, Mona Lisa of Galilee, the Kunlet Arjun of Straka, Pin Peter's house full of Siloam, Ashkelon's arch gate, Jerusalem's stepstone structure, Jerusalem's Babylonian siege structure. I won't spend a lot of time on each one of them. I want you to see the visual effect more than anything else because every one of them, you get very good references on the internet. So you don't need me to tell you what you can find out, right? So look at the first one, the Coptic Nag Hammadi Library. This is probably the most famous discovery in the 20th century that relates directly to the New Testament times. There is an analogy to this, uh, analog to this, sorry. You have the Dead Sea Scrolls discovered around the same time, about two years after this, and that has to do with the Old Testament. This has to do with the New Testament. Now these include what we call the Lost Gospels, the Gospels that are not included in the four Gospels that we have, which are called the Canonical Gospels. If you read in the slide, it says, the Nag Hammadi texts were contained in 13 leather-bound volumes of codices discovered by Egyptian farmers in 1945. Now, whenever you see the word codices or uh, codex, which is the um, singular, it means these are writings that do not go back before the 4th century AD, because the codex is another word for what we now call a book. Before that, they were mostly scrolls. So when you see a codex, you know that it's not as old as you think. It's not before the time of Jesus. It was after the time of Jesus, when the earliest books were bound together. Dated papyrus scraps used to strengthen the binding of the books tells us they were written in the mid fourth century CE or AD. Same thing, right? Common era. The library contains more than 50 texts that explore the views of a Christian sect known uh, who were in conflict with Orthodox Christian authorities. By the 17th century, they were referred to as Gnostics. Now remember, typically in any kind of conflict, especially religious conflicts, your names are normally given to you by your enemies and you're known by your um, derogatory names, including Christian, by the way. The word Christian wasn't selected by Christians. It was referred to them as those who follow the Christ. And in the early days of Roman Empire, or at least in Jesus' time, to be a follower of the Christ was very demeaning because, you know, he died on the cross. So if you follow the Christ, you're one of the losers, basically. Rest us. Let's look at the next slide. The Ain Dara Temple near Aleppo. This is very interesting because Aleppo is in the news now, right? Syria. And this is about 40 miles from Aleppo in Syria. A 10th century BCE temple was discovered in 1955. For those of you who are a bit familiar with the Old Testament and the dating, 10th century is really, really far back. Who was around in the 10th century? Very important person. King. Anybody? David? It's right there. Solomon. It's the closest structure to Solomon's oh, temple, right. <laughs> of which nothing exists. So here's an interesting thing. If you go now to Jerusalem, and you go to the Temple Mount, and your guide will tell you this is where Solomon's temple was. Well, it's a, it's a guess. There are no remains of Solomon's temple. So we have no idea what it actually looks like at all. This is the closest that we've ever discovered because it was built around the same time. It was built, it was close to the size of the temple. And typically, the sizes of buildings and structures um, depend on the quality of technology and building materials and, archi and uh, architecture. If you know how to build a certain thing, a certain way, you can increase the size. So one good example is, if you go to Istanbul and go to Hagia Sophia, the, large, the largest church in the world for a long, long time, and you'll see that the size of the dome was uh, limited, even though it's a huge dome, limited by the technology of able to make a dome without a central structure supporting it. And they were brilliant. They had this huge dome, and then they had some sitting on smaller domes mm -hmm. so that you could have a huge area with nothing in between to support it. Beautiful. In any case, when Justinian, the king who had commissioned this church to build, the legend was that when he built it, he said, Oh, Solomon, I have surpassed thee. He argued that his church was bigger than Solomon's temple in Hagia Sophia. So that's where you are. And this is a very interesting um, ruin, as it were. I hope it's still there that no one's destroyed it. No, it's quite nice. But a lot of, uh, no, it's uh, too far away from Aleppo itself, and there's no strategic value because it's not, it's not directly Jewish or Christian. But for archaeologists, this is the closest we can find to a kind of architecture built around the same time. You look at the building materials, 
we look at uh, why they, they have certain uh, architectural designs and that gives us a hint of how the temple could have been. So this is uh, interesting for us from that point of view. Look at the next slide, number three. The Tel Dan of David Stella. St Dan, Tel simply means it's a mound. So all archaeological mounds start with the word Tel, T-E-L, sometimes T-E-L. It just means a mound. Mound. Like M-O-U-N-D. A mound. A mound, okay? It's basically when cities um, sort of collapse or they're no longer they're abandoned, they're covered with soil and sand and everything else. And then another group may build upon it and upon it and upon it. So mounds are normally quite high, sometimes up to 100 feet high. So if you go to Israel or Turkey or any of the old civilizations, you find a lot of mounds all over the place and you know that's the city inside. One good example is the city of Colossae, where Paul um, wrote to the Colossians. There's a mound. We know it's Colossae. It hasn't been dug yet because there's no money to dig it. So it's still inside. And when I went to visit it in 2009, the going price at the time was quite cheap, uh, $250,000 and you can start digging. So we were joking about, can we, can we have uh, Bill Gates you know, help us uh, dig about 10 to 15 mounds? But that's how cheap it is, relatively speaking, to actually dig into a mound, but it's still there. Now, most archeologists are okay with that because we also want to leave some stuff for the future generations to dig because they will have better technology than we do. <coughs> and one example is China. I was recently in Xinjiang. The tomb of the first emperor of China, Shi Huang Ti, the first noted emperor, is still there in a mound and it's unexcavated even by the Chinese government because they realized that it would be very greedy of us to open everything right now because you can open it only once. Once you open it, if you don't have the technology to interpret it, it's gone forever. The next generation cannot, cannot meaningfully say, I know what it is because it's been contaminated by definition. Mm -hmm. okay. So let me give an idea of contamination. In my very first dig in Beth Shemesh, which, is, which means the house of the sun in Israel, uh, all junior archaeologists are sent to places that are not as um, <coughs> pristine. So if you mess up, you don't mess up many things. So we're normally sent to places where it's unlikely to find anything. So we save the time of the serious guys who wanted to waste the time looking for dry, dry grounds, right? And the joke was, um, when a guy's digging seriously, and you suddenly plant a Coca-Cola bottle cap nearby, this whole thing is destroyed because he knows that would be 1940, 1930. It's nothing to do with Roman ruins, right? So by the same token, these are called surface finds. When you find anything on the surface that's not embedded in rock, it means it's portable. It could be put there by somebody last night. You can't trust it. Do you see the thing? Now, if that coin or um, the ostraca or anything that you find is embedded in a, in a rock, then you can measure that rock or the mud to see the, the, the date of that and that's the date where uh, likely to be the date where the coin was embedded in. Even though coins struck normally have dates by themselves. In any case, so um, we come to number three, the fragmentary tell, tell them stuff. So tell means mound. Done is uh, today it's a, 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 an area in Israel. Um, some people will call it an ancient town. So a Tel Dan Stella is a stone uh, monument that came from the city of Dan and is now a ruin. So Tel Dan Stella provided the first extra biblical evidence for the existence of King David. Extra biblical means it is not an evidence from the Bible. It is from outside the Bible, which is actually for, for us in archaeology, even more important, more impressive, which means it's not an internal thing saying, well, I said so. So if this is indeed the evidence of King David, then it's incredibly exciting. The Aramean king who erected the stella in the mid 9th century BCE claims to have defeated the king of Israel and the king of the house of David. You look at the right hand side of the stone, you see that bit in white. About to ask in about white. That, yeah. Okay, reading from the right hand side, there are three words B E T, bet, meaning house of. Mm -hmm. Then the other three words, you see the delta, right? So it's D V D, oh. David. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yep. See? yep. Delta yep. is D. Okay, so, so that's ba Bet David, House of David. So when you read the whole stone, it um, the stone wasn't erected by King David, erected by someone who claimed he defeated the house of King David. In fact, <coughs> so this is uh, highly controversial, <coughs> very exciting. The jury is kind of still out. Most people think it is, and others are more um, careful about this because they said, well, it could be another David. 
for them to do this particular sure. behavior. But the evidence is uh, pretty impressive. That's all I can say at this stage, right? So this is one of the strongest extra biblical. When you come across extra biblical evidence of the Bible, it's extremely precious. Because it's not, that means it's not from the Bible itself, outside the Bible. Like this saying that this yep. war happened. Like, this because this war. is not in the Bible. This is a stone. Not, not, it's not something like, I read it here. Mm -hmm. Extra biblical can also mean another text. It doesn't have to be stone. can be another piece of literature that's not included in our Bible that attests to it. So attest simply means that that sort of um, bears witness to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it talks about it. A stella is a... A stella is like a, a monument, typically stone monument. If you go to my Facebook page and you'll see, um, I did a lecture in Malaysia and also in the UK and as well as, uh, oh, I forget where else, uh, here in New York, I talked about the stella of the Nestorian tablet that arrived in China from Baghdad in the 7th century. So what I had was an ink rubbing of the actual stone. The stone is in China, it's about 9 foot tall, and those are called stellas. It's not a picture, right. So that's called a stella. Okay. okay? Look at number four. The Mona Lisa of Galilee, the forest. So this was also a, a pretty recent discovery. Beautiful mosaic done in Roman times. And um, Sephoris is a hill town built by the Romans for either the landed gentry or some important person. <coughs> you know. And today, if you go to Israel, you can actually take a hike up. It's a bit of a hike, but you can get up there to see the remains that are quite stunning, including water pipes made of clay to mix hot and cold water and stuff like that. And Sephora, famously, is the nearest large city to the village of Nazareth. So many people believe that um, Jesus and his father, Joseph, they were stonemasons or workers helping to build the city of Sephora. Because Nazareth is really kind of almost in the middle of nowhere, and there's no reason to have a, a town there. And it wasn't really even a town. In fact, a lot of um, excavators make the case that in the time of Jesus, there are probably no more than 20 homes in that location. So it's not a town as you would think about you know, uh, in today's terms. 1,000 people, 2,000 people, it's not. It's also probably not a natural town. I would say it's more like um, a camp for the laborers, and that it, it grew to be a place where they lived, because it would take years to build a city like the forest. So that's another very interesting connection to us. It helps us understand um, the technologies involved, the kind of stone they use, the skills needed, and, and where to locate Nazareth in the context of the Roman Empire. Because remember, when we read about Bethlehem and Nazareth, we tend to think of it as, oh, if the Bible mentioned it, it must be significantly very important, it's a big city and all that. When you do archaeology, it's very small, and you get very disappointed. Why? So, getting, putting um, all the various towns from the Bible in the context of the super Roman Empire will give you a context, will help you understand, which is really important. Now, it's a bit like this. When, um, when I was living in Princeton, our postal code says Princeton. But really, the town I lived in was called West Windsor. But real estate people think, if you put it as Princeton, you can fetch a higher price. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, in every major city you have that, Chicago, New York, it doesn't matter. You can live 100 miles away and you say, I kind of live in New York. And then you find out, oh, you mean Connecticut? <laughs> yeah. I, and the same thing happened in the context of people writing of the Bible. The writers tend to elevate the importance of the towns and cities that they're talking about, understandably. But getting a context of the bigger picture helps us understand. So the Mona Lisa of Galilee in Sephora was uh, very interesting. As you know, Galilee is the northern part of Israel. And that's where Jesus had most of his ministry. That's where he met many of the disciples. So that became an important focal point for archaeologists. Look sorry, at number five. Can, yeah. Really quickly, sorry, you said that it wasn't the typical town in terms of like a modern city. You're talking about Sephoris or, no, the, or Nazareth. Nazareth. Oh, Nazareth. Nazareth. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Sephoris was built on a hill, which means when you want to build on a hill, uh, it's pretty impressive. You've got to pump water up there. That's really incredible. The and how, how big was the forest? Oh, we don't know. It's not fully excavated yet. But okay. um, but it was the actual city. It's or actual, whatever, like, for that it's time. A, it's a very serious, not just a city, it's a luxury city. Oh. That's why they find mosaics. That's when you find mosaic like that, you need a serious money. Even today, <laughs> I mean, you try to have someone have a mosaic like that in their house, it's stunning. Because oh, yeah. every piece of stone and glass have to be 
constructed and uh, artists would have become, right? Number five, the Kuntilet Arjun Ostraka, an inscription preserved on an inscribed pot shirt. An ostraka is a pot shirt, meaning it's a remains of a, a clay pot broken up. You can see on the left hand side. From the site of Kuntilet Arjun in the Sinai, it makes reference to Yahweh and his Asherah, suggesting that some Israelites believe their God had a wife. So it's kind of hard to see on the left hand side. So someone did a very nice line drawing on the right hand side. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and normally, as I said, uh, biblical studies and theology is, um, they're not shy about telling you who's a male and who's a female, right? You can tell. Uh, <laughs> you can see the, the, the penal elongation there to say that these are males. In any case, the identification is referring to Yahweh and that Yahweh uh, has a wife. Okay? I'm sorry, so is that a picture of Yahweh? Uh, we think so. Remember, there are not many words to go to describe what it is. So. When you have a pot shot, it's always a fragment of a bigger picture. So there are two men in the front, and the woman is back there on the chair. Yeah, right? yeah. So there's two gods. Uh, not necessarily, because it just says Yahweh and his Asherah. Asherah is referring to a goddess. Where's the inscription? Uh, we don't really know. Okay. Yeah, a lot of guesses. We don't really know. So, but the drawing, this is the closest drawing can have to it, okay? Have you I, seen any of these? Uh, of most of them, yeah, yeah, wow. sure. Um, and you know what, today they're so good. Um, I think IBM, along with Google and other companies, they are making high resolution photographs available online for any scholar. And sooner or later, they will release to the entire world to have a look at it. So, so technology going forward, <coughs> my suspicion is that going forward, the new generation of Christians will not be satisfied by just reading uh, the Bible. They want to know more because there's so much more to know now, right? Now, what does that mean when you say some Israelites believe that God had a wife? And this is very striking, very stunning, very shocking for some people. Um, part of studying archaeology is also to understand what was included in our text and what was excluded. So clearly this part of the information was excluded, right? Because the early church and even some of the Jews didn't accept this. So it's not for us to judge what's wrong and right because it's not our task and we can't do it. But we're just looking at historically how did they believe which means belief in Yahweh itself has evolved over time. Because by the time it came to us, we don't have an idea of Yahweh having a wife. So uh, Peter Inns famously uh, mentioned quite recently, he's a professor of Old Testament, that he now realized the Bible, we should not see the Bible as God's revelation. It is our response to God's revelation. And just as important. And that's why responses are never perfect and it's okay. Responses can change over time and it's okay because our ideas change over time, our abilities change over time, and we shouldn't blame people in the past for not having the same level of knowledge as we have today. But if we have access to the knowledge and we don't use it, then we are irresponsible because we are not helping those coming after us to, to get more information. By the way, those who are doing this online, feel free to ask questions on anything you can't ask because you're listening to this. And you can ask it in the forum that Danny has sent you the link. But remember, every time you ask a question, give a provisional answer. Because otherwise, anyone can just throw questions around, okay? Peter's house, number six. Beneath the foundations of this octagonal Byzantine, Byzantine Martyrium church at Capernaum, Capernaum is a town, archaeologists discovered a first century home that may have been inhabited by Jesus. This is a stronger claim that I'm comfortable with, but I get what they're trying to say in this context. This is a kind of home built in the same period that Jesus lived in, in a town that Jesus would have been there. But this is not the actual home of the first century. Read carefully the first slide. Yeah. Beneath the foundations of this Byzantine material, Byzantine is anything after the fourth century AD but it was built on the foundations of an earlier house. So they're thinking that earlier house could well have been a kind of house that Jesus would have inhabited, or at least his friends. Number seven, Pool of Siloam, <coughs> very, 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 yes, Danny. What's a martyrium? Um, martyrium, well, for some people, they, they, they want to think of it as a place where uh, they were celebrated the martyrs, you know, but. 
I'm sure archaeology there's a lot of uncertainty about uh, what exactly it is because all we have are these stones and very often no plaque telling you this is what it is. And you'll find later on in the next few weeks, when you look at architecture or foundations, there's a point in time you can't tell whether it's a synagogue or a church because it, it evolves. A synagogue has a different focus, a church has a different focus. So. Uh, I'm giving the impression that there's a lot of guesswork involved in archaeology, and absolutely, they're educated guesses, but they're still guesses. There's nothing telling us this is what it is. Now, here's an example, number seven. Right, but that's not a house. That's the There's a foundation of a church, of a, temple. Of a, a, a public building built in the Byzantine period, but they built of a foundations of a home. So we can't see the home now, but we know it was built on an original home of the first century. Oh, so this home. So they decided cool to put a church where Jesus may have lived. Okay. There's, There's a lot of places we, like we that. We think a lot of people do that. Yeah. A lot that's what. Do that. That's what Saint Helena. Um, uh, not Saint Helena. Uh, Empress Helena did. The mother of Constantine. She was considered the first <coughs> archaeologist in the world in the fourth century, and she would go to different places, and she'll ask the locals, "Do you remember Jesus? Where do you think?" And of course, they'll tell her anything you want to hear for money, right? That is, that is, and that is, and that's why they built all these churches all over the place. And they're conflicting churches. So today, if you go to Jerusalem, you have two or three places where Jesus was buried, depending on which denomination you're in. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Can you see which one is the old house and which one is the um, actual You can't see from there. Um, this is the temple. The octagonal thing is the temple, the Macarian. Okay, number seven, the Pool of Siloam. Uh, identified by Eli Shukron and Ronnie Wright. Ronnie Wright's been there for a long, long time. So he's one of the long-termers over there. And when they say identified, meaning the locals have always known it existed, but they never knew what it was. So identification is also a job of an archaeologist, not just digging. Sometimes it's just there, but no one knew what it was. He identified the steps as part of the Pool of Siloam. Here, Jesus cured a man, found in John chapter 9, verses 1 to 11. And today, it's a very, very major tourist site. If you are on pilgrimage to Israel, go and have a look at it. And um, at the risk of being um, at the risk of being arrested, I'm just going to share that I think it's 2003 or four when I was there. I went to the very end where you can see the people are tourists, and there was a, a old guard who offered to sell me some coins. And I said, I can't buy these coins. He said, sure you can, because you belong to me. So I said, where do you get it? They're not, they're not pristine coins. They are marked and all that. And he said, according to the government, if it is something rejected by the archaeologists and just sitting there, then we can get and it's not monitored and all that, right? Okay, I, I will not mention what happened after that, but just to mention that there are still people discovering things all over the place right now. Hmm. And... Um, the coins he showed me was a first century palm coin of Herod the Great, and another one was a what we now call a widow's mite. One of them is a shekel, one is a mite, so the smallest coin. I you may know have the widow's seen mite? We have just talked about, you know? The, sorry? I may have just seen something similar in your apartment. <laughs> not confirming. Yeah, don't speak too loudly. Let's move on to number eight. <laughs> move on. Move on. Number eight, Ashkelon's Arch Gate. So, number eight, slide number eight. The world's oldest arch gateway was discovered at Ashkelon in the summer of 1992. Can you imagine how recent this was? It's quite staggering. Yeah. The gate was originally built during the Middle Bronze Age, 1850. Now, last week, if you look at last week's slides, you'll see we went to Late Bronze Age, Middle Bronze Age, and then we went to um, the Early Bronze Age. Uh, sorry, the Early Bronze Age, Middle Bronze Age, and then Late Bronze Age. And if you recall, the Middle Bronze Age is the age that is connected to Abraham. So look at this date, 1850, smack in the middle of um, the historical dating of Abraham. So partly because it's in Ashkelon, which is one of the uh, Philistine cities on the west coast of Israel, it's a, it's a port. And this photograph, I think, was taken um, well after I went there. I went there in 1997 to have a look at it. So the... The arch bit is really important because we have always thought that the Romans were the ones who helped develop the arch. So you can build something curved like that with a capstone so, the, so that the weight spreads on the either side, right? So that uh, they've always given the Romans the idea that, wow, they've done it. When this was discovered, it was very shocking because this was way, way before the Romans. To give you a context, 
Historically, Rome was founded in 753 BC. This is 1850 BC. Who gets the credit now? The Ashkenaz, the Philistines. And who are the Philistines? They are. They would have come from what today we would call southern Italy, western Greece. They were the sea peoples. They were the feared sea peoples who would come. Number nine, Jerusalem's stepstone structure is called the Milo. The Milo was a rampart built by the Jebusites before David's conquest of Jerusalem. The Jebusites are the people who lived in a town called Jebus, and Jebus became Jerusalem after David conquered it. So David actually took an existing town, basically. It was rebuilt by Solomon and repaired by Hezekiah. You can see in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 5, verse 9, and corresponding passages in Chronicles and Kings, because this statement is sort of repeated in Chronicles and Kings. If you look at your reference in the Bible, you'll find them. So this was also another amazing discovery, because it was actually mentioned in the Bible itself. Number 10, Jerusalem's Babylonian siege tower. Discovered in 1975, built around 600 BCE, reference the Second Kings chapter 15, but it fell to the Babylonians in 586. So here's a question: Why would you call it Jerusalem's Babylonian siege tower? Well, partly because it was it's it's located in Jerusalem, but the siege tower was to fight to fight against the Babylonians, and the Babylonians managed to uh, enter the city anyway in 586. So the big question was, was this siege tower there before the Babylonians came or was it built by the Babylonians? So you have people discussing one or the other, but in any case, the reference is 2 Kings chapter 15. So here are the 10 um, interesting things to start us off on discoveries in the Bible. So it helps us understand when people say, are there any archaeological artifacts that's related to the Bible? Actually quite a lot. They're not related to the people as much as they're related to references in the Bible itself. And let's um, look at the next slide. 2A, archaeological discoveries that shape our understanding of the Bible. So now we've seen these 10 slides, we have an idea of <coughs> how archaeology plays a very major role in the way we understand whether the Bible is historical or this part is um, metaphorical. A parable is always not a historical event. I want to compare archaeology and biblical archaeology. So archaeology itself is a historical and scientific study of material things from the human past. Material things means they are not ideas, they are stuff. Stuff that you can hold, you can measure, you can uh, study. Biblical archaeology began in the 19th century by American clergymen in response to general archaeology. <coughs> Their goal was to discover proof of scientific and historical accuracy of the Bible. The European biblical archaeologists tend to be lay people more concerned about findings the findings wherever the conclusions, whatever the conclusions. So you have two kinds of people interested, the Americans and the, and the British. The British were, uh, in a sense, they were not looking for proof necessarily, they just want to know what's happening, what's true. The Americans were more dogmatic, they were more interested in finding proof. So you have a bit of a, bit of a clash of civilizations here. Bible commentaries drew from archaeological research to support their interpretations so that every sermon is influenced by, at the end of the day, field excavations. Which means, do not think for one moment that if you're a preacher, a Bible teacher, you're not influenced by these sort of archaeological stuff, you're absolutely influenced because these interpretations of the artifacts make their way to commentaries. And Bible teachers read commentaries and then become sermons, becomes a teaching, right? So right now what I'm bringing you to, I'm bringing you into the depths of how theology is developed. How teaching is understood because preachers do not invent out of thin air they rely on material and they rely on books and at the end of the day they rely on archaeology you can see the importance of this right let's look at the next slide the next two slides are just for your reference it's, it's very boring just dates but it's important in that it helps you appreciate where the categories are and, and as I said um, especially Constance Hill don't worry about slight differing dates in different references because you will find these are rough guesstimates, okay? okay. Pre-8000 to 4500 BC, it's called a Paleolithic. Paleo simply means old. That's why we have Paleoanthropology, old humans. Oh. Lithic, lithos, it refers to stones. So 
Paleolithic means old stone or prehistoric. Neolithic means new stone. So Neolithic, when we say new stone, what does it mean? It doesn't mean just stones. It's the agricultural age. It's the age where people begin to start um, planting crops. They, they settle down. They're no longer nomadic as much. Then we've got the Chalcolithic period. Chalco refers to copper, uh, copper and stone. It means they have developed a furnace hot enough to melt copper, and they can make implements from copper. Then later on, you find the Bronze Age. So you keep finding stronger and stronger metals and alloys. Then after the Bronze Age, with the Iron Age. Iron Age 1, Iron Age 2, Iron Age 3, and they are linked to specific books or people in the Bible. Iron Age 1 is the judging, meaning the time of the judges. You find the book of Judges. Iron Age 2 is monarchy, so the kings. There are three United Kings, right? King Saul, King David, King Solomon. All the way down to the last of the Ju kings of Judah in 586, because that last king, uh, once he was taken to exile by the Babylonians, there was no longer an Israel. So Israel as a country didn't exist from 586 BC until when? Two. Until 1947. <laughs> That's how far back is it? Yeah. There were intermittent periods in the hundreds and two hundreds where people felt well, they were strong enough to resist the Romans for a while, but it wasn't, it wasn't really universally controlled by them. In any case, you can see now why many of the Palestinians felt it's unfair to say that God gave you the land and you had it all along, because you didn't have it all along. You lost it for a really long time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, 1,500 years. It's a really long time. So please don't come and tell me that you had it. Look at the next um, slide. Wait, what was the Iron Age 3? Which uh, Bible books? Oh. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Iron Age 3 is the Assyrian, the Babylonian, and the Persian periods, right? So that's from 586 to 322. Is that the rest of the Bible books? Um, the rest, no, not rest Bible books. There's another slide coming up. Okay. okay, this is until Alexander the Great. When you see 332, you're thinking Alexander, the Greek period. Because that's when the, Greek the Greeks defeated the Persians. Okay, look at the next slide. Archaeological periods in Palestine. Now we've got the Hellenistic period. Hellenistic, uh, Elas, or H-E-L-L-E-S, refers to Greece. So this is the Hellenistic period. Greek, Greece and its influences. 322 to 63 BC. This is all about Palestine only. It's not um, the Greek civilization. This is the Greek influence in that area in town, uh, in that area in the country. Roman period, Byzantine period, the Muslim <coughs> Arab period, the Crusader period, the Makluk, Mamluk period, Ottoman period, the British period, and then the state of Israel in 1948. So look at the Muslim periods, right? That's Ottoman all the way to 638. So think about it. From 638 AD, to 1918 AD, this was Islamic, it's Muslim. So, so when we make a lot of claims that you know, it's always been Israel, be very mindful of actual historical international relations, right? It's not the case. Then the British was there for 30 years. Okay, so let's take a short break here. Good, good news.